and I was like okay like that was a little bit of a miss but I'm sure once we go back to YA you'll be fine girly <clears throat> oh goodness me okay hello <laughs> how am I gonna sit I need to be like a half an inch taller. This isn't going to work forever, but it's going to work for now. Okay. Hi, everyone. Hello. Welcome to another monthly wrap-up. Um, my name is Carrie. You guys might know, if you aren't new here, that I have trouble remembering plots on a good day, um, but this month has been so exciting in so many amazing ways um, that the first of this month feels like a lifetime ago. Um, I went to Prague and Vienna. I met quite a few of you guys in both cities. That was really great. Um, and then yesterday, two days ago, I was traveling to a couple different cities here in Korea chasing the cherry blossoms. It was very amazing. Um, so I've just been kind of running around and I got a lot of reading done because so much of this month was spent like on trains and very long airplane rides. Um, so I did read a lot, but it's it's one of those things where like, what on earth was going on? Um, so the first book, uh, <laughs> thank God I write down what I read because I would never have remembered reading this book, um, even though I really enjoyed it. So I'm gonna jump in, we've got kind of a mix of genres this month actually. Um, but before I do that, need to give a shout out to the sponsor of this video, which is Squarespace. Um, that is where I have been hosting my personal blog for about four years now. And Squarespace is a great place to host any kind of online presence. They have different features like monetization, connecting your social media accounts, or even creating these kind of subscription and membership level based things. So you can make a blog like myself, or it's great for online shopping. Um, it's really good for making some kind of online community and it's also good for people like me who aren't very tech savvy. The analytics section is so easy to understand. Setting it up um, in terms of all of the free templates they have, the customization features they have for making your website look super professional. Um, it's a really great service and so if you want to try it out for free, you can go to squarespace.com right now and you can play with the templates and everything, kind of get your website set up. And then when you are ready to launch it, you can go to squarespace.com slash carry can read for 10% off of your first website or domain. And I will link my website down below. <sighs> Let's dive in. I spent the morning watching the first three episodes of Shadow and Bone. I have gotten so many requests for my reaction. I wasn't sure if I was going to film it, um, but I am. So I'm a little wired and my voice is already kind of going. So we'll see how this video goes. Starting with my first book, diving right in. First book that I read in March, I read it on March 1st, I remember, is a book called Just By Looking At Him. I heard about this through Jesse on YouTube. I heard that it was an incredibly funny book that also dealt really well with disabilities. So this book, I thought it was a memoir. It reads like a memoir, but it's not. Names have been changed. It follows a young, TV writer, um, a writer of comedy, who has cerebral palsy. And it follows his life through this kind of tumultual period where he's been with his partner for a very long time and all of a sudden he just starts seeing a sex worker and kind of starts developing a relationship with them. So you know that that's just not going to end up well. It's just handled in such a dark, funny way. Every single person felt so real. Let me check how it's... It's not a memoir. Yeah, the genres, um, according to Google, are humor, erotic literature, gay fiction, dark comedy, humorous fiction. So like I said, it's not a memoir, but the actual author does have cerebral palsy and is a queer TV writer. So, you know, it's, mm -hmm. but yeah, it was just, there were some laugh out loud funny things, but it was extremely dark. So yeah, it was just quite a bit different from the stuff that I had been reading. And so it was a nice little change. And it was some good representation of disabilities written by a person who actually lives through it. So it was, I felt like I learned a lot in that sense as well. So definitely recommend um, if you're down for like some dark stuff just by looking at it. After that, I got, ooh, Adventures of Amina al-Sirafi. 
Um, this is by the same author who wrote the Devabod trilogy. This one is a little different. It's not that the fourth wall is being broken, but it's like the narrator and the main character interact. It's like Amina sits down to tell the narrator the story and the narrator is writing it and then Amina will randomly be like, oh, don't give me that look or something like that. You know, like if she says something and the writer is clearly like, huh? That made it a little clunky because it, that effect was used so rarely that I almost forgot that that's kind of what we were doing. So it sort of like took me out of the story for a second. Like, oh yeah, right. We're being told this by a weird narrator. And it, that was just like really weird. I wanted her to either commit to that style or take it away because it was sprinkled in sporadically. But essentially we are following a retired pirate I suppose, who is living a very quiet life in hiding with her daughter. And she has been hired for one final job. She obviously doesn't want to take it, but the person who has hired her has basically said, if you don't, I know where your family lives and I can burn down the house and everything that you love, you know? Our lovely retired pirate gets the crew back together and goes on this one last adventure. I thought that it was such an interesting take to have like um, an older mother figure as the main character and like go back to action, kind of reflecting on even after you have kids, like you still have dreams and you, you're still the same person you were before kids. Like she still is so hungry for adventure and still loves being free out on the open ocean and stuff like that. Quite refreshing coming from reading a lot of young adult fantasy where the characters are like, this is their first real adventure, you know? Um, this was her returning to a life that she kind of set aside. And I really liked that. And again, I also just really liked the writing style um, other than like that weird clunky narrator thing she had going on. And I will also read anything about pirates like literally give me any pirate book and I will read it so I think I enjoyed it it was very like mid for me I would say in terms of like the plot I really liked the relationships between the characters and I want to know more about that but in terms of the plot where you know she was doing the thing that she was hired to do mm, I didn't like that quite as much, but I can see it as a setup for the rest of the series. I didn't think it was going to be a series. I thought it was going to be a standalone, as I always do. I can see how it's going to be um, a series. So that was The Adventures of Amina al Sarafi. I would say good, not great, um, but I'm interested to see where it goes. And I think if you liked uh, City of Brass, you should definitely give it a try. I'm gonna be real quick about this one. I read The Only Woman in the Room. Um, this was in order to get ready for my trip to Vienna. It follows a woman who is based on Hedy Lamar, the actress uh, from the 30s and 40s. We follow her life, which is so incredibly interesting in real life, not in the book, but in real life, she is a Jewish Austrian actress. She is stunningly beautiful and so she just kind of took the theater world by storm and she ended up marrying this really icky man. Finds a way to escape him, escape Europe, makes her way to Hollywood where she becomes a big star, changes her name to Hedy Lamarr. But the most interesting thing about her is she's also an inventor and she ends up inventing something that really helps with the war and eventually like put us on the path to wi-fi like she's she's incredible she like works with radio frequency and all of this stuff and so i went into this book knowing that it was basically the retelling of her life and the author focused on kind of the least interesting parts of her let's say 60. 60% of the book is her getting married to this icky guy who ends up being incredibly abusive. She escapes and gets to Hollywood for probably 30% of the book. And then the last 10%, this little sliver is like, oh, radio frequency, huh? And that's all it, like at the very, very end, it's like, oh, by the way, she like made this thing that helped us win the war. It was so strange and uninteresting. I think that could have been better as an audiobook because it definitely read 
like an old woman was just telling you the story of her life. So I think it could have been a good audiobook, but still that doesn't change the fact that the actual contents were, I felt, kind of fumbled. Um, I really wanted to hear more just about her inventive part of her life. Most of the book was about her being a victim of domestic violence. I would honestly pass on it and it kind of put me off of all of this, all the author's other work because that's her shtick is that she writes kind of fictionalized retellings of important women's lives. Um, so that was the only woman in the room pass. But after that, I actually bought this book because I knew I didn't want to wait like 16 weeks at the library for it. And I'm glad that I did. This is The Last Tale of the Flower Bride. This is by the author of the Gilded Wolves trilogy, which I adored. So of course I was gonna pick this up. This was unexpected. And I'm gonna say, before I even tell you the plot, I think that the cover and the title are doing this book dirty. I feel like people who would love this book are not gonna pick it up because of the title and the cover. And if you've read it, let me know. Is there a horse on my street? What is that noise? Okay, no, it's just someone hammering. How weird. If you've read it, let me know what you think about the, the cover and the title. I'll put the cover that I know of um, right here. But The Tale of the Last Flower Bride is this dark, luscious fairy tale um, that is so twisted. It's like, oh, how would I even describe it? It felt familiar, but at the same time quite new. I think that maybe people who liked kind of like House of Hollow, like this very in the modern world, but like just dripping with all of these details of like fae stuff. I wish I could explain it better. It is broken into two different timelines where we follow this man who meets a woman and they end up starting a relationship and we kind of follow them. The two of them, the reason that they immediately connect is that they are both obsessed with fairy tales and just kind of darkness in general. The other part of the story is back in the past with our main girls childhood. I'm not explaining this well. So her childhood is basically this dark fairy tale. We have our main girl who is the heiress to a hotel empire, but I believe her parents died, so she's living with her aunt in the, the mansion in Oregon that she owns, um, or the Pacific Northwest. It does not feel like they're living like an American teenager life, but here we are. She just like lives the life of like a fairy. She likes to lay out and soak up the moon and only eats things if they're dipped in honey and like all this weird stuff. And then we have a new girl in town who has moved here with her mother and her mother's nap, like they soon find out, abusive boyfriend. So she gets out of the house as much as possible and is sort of adopted by this other rich girl and follows her around like a shadow. And so together they believe that when they turn 18, they are going to be reunited with the Fey world where they are going to rule. They're basically, they believe themselves to be almost like changelings. They think that they've been kicked out of the Fey world. So they like live very unattached to the life around them because they're like, no, 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 we're, you don't understand, we're Fey. And it's just very eerie and dark. And we know that something horrible happens. It all comes to a head, of course, at the end. I think more than anything, I liked it for the atmosphere, for the words that the author chose. It just really felt like a fairy tale. L literally, I just, the words, the word choice was gorgeous. It also has quite a few twists and I thought that the twists were interesting. I think I saw a couple coming, but I thought that they were done well. And I also really liked the ending. I thought that that was such an interesting thing. Overall, like I I just really enjoyed it. I, I was reading it when I was in Prague. You know, when you're reading a, a really good book, like a really atmospheric book, and then you close it and you go about life and you still kind of feel the remnants of the story on you. That's how I felt and I was in Prague, which looks like a freaking fairy tale. I will link that vlog down below. But so I just, I just really felt like I was enveloped in this story and it took me quite a few days to read because I was traveling. So it just, I 
felt really really sucked in um and I highly recommend if you're into like very dark fairy tales I would say like it it was definitely eerie and mm, I would say yeah definitely like House of Hollow but really really excellent I really enjoyed it the last tale of the flower bride done dirty by the cover Mm -hmm. After that, I read Light from Uncommon Stars. I had heard a lot of people talking about it recently, and so I picked it up without knowing anything about it, and it had pretty much everything I was not expecting. We follow a bunch of different characters, and that's one of my problems with the book, but our main character, what the story kind of circles around is our main girl who has transitioned. She's, she's a young trans girl who has been essentially kicked out of her house. Or I think she leaves, but I mean, she was essentially kicked out of her house by her family, tries to go live with a boyfriend that she had for a while, also leaves because it's a really bad situation. The only thing in her life is her violin. She ends up getting picked up by this violin teacher who is known as the Queen of Hell. We learn throughout the story that there's a very good reason for why she is called the Queen of Hell. I, I forget what exactly are spoilers, but we're we're following this girl as she trains underneath this violin teacher and her absolutely wonderful housekeeper. I don't want to spoil too much, so I'll just say that there are definitely humans aliens, demons, and this like weird magic. This is my second book in two months, I think, um, that is about the violin and I just have found that I love reading about violins, um, talking about how they're made, how the sound comes out. Um, I thought that those details, just about the music, was so good. I eventually loved all of the dynamics between the characters, but there were just, I felt like one too many, so that I ended up forgetting about certain things. There's a, there's a talking computer character. Um, I mean, it's really, there's so much going on. It did connect, technically, all connect at the end, um, but it just felt a little discombobulated, so as far as like me enjoying the characters and enjoying reading it, I loved certain parts and other parts I was really lost. Um, I would have cut a couple characters even though I understand why they were there, but I would still recommend, um, especially if you love reading about, I guess, music and belonging and I guess love in all shapes and forms. Um, definitely good, but yeah, just a little too many things going on in there. So that was Light from Uncommon Stars. After that, my last book of the trip, I read this on a couple trains, um, is The Magician's Daughter. I remember, I think it was other authors I like mentioned this book is how I found out about it. And this was a really odd little book. We follow a girl who lives on this island off of the coast of Ireland, like out in the middle of the Atlantic. She lives with this magician and his familiar, who is more often than not in the form of a rabbit. He can turn into a human when he wants to, but it takes a lot of magic for him to do that. She has never left the island. She has never met anyone else other than those two people. She does not have magic. She knows that she's not this magician's biological daughter. She was found washed up on shore. This island is magical, so nobody else can get there. The magician has the ability to turn into a raven, so he can go fly off and get them supplies when needed, but one day, he doesn't come back. And so our story begins. I can't really tell you more than that. I thought that the story could have been better served if it actually had more POVs. The way that we're told the story is only through the girl, um, and she doesn't know anything. I mean, she, she does eventually get off the island. I mean, spoiler, but as our story unfolds, she's like amazed by tiny little things 
um, because she only knows things from books. She's just in the dark about so many things and the story unfolds really slowly. And so like sometimes that's okay, like getting told the story in itty bitty pieces and just watching it unfold is really nice. But in this way, it was more kind of frustrating to read. I felt like because it was also from this girl's POV, we didn't understand the depth of the relationships of all the other people and it's really about the relationships between the other people um so we don't really understand the love and the betrayal and the history that she doesn't get so we could see it on the surface but i feel like if we could have gotten more povs from different characters it would have made the story hit harder it was a little bit of a letdown i thought that it had a ton of potential but overall i just really couldn't get into it and I at first I thought it was just because I was traveling and so I was reading it in these kind of short spurts but I really think that it was mainly that that we couldn't really sink into those characters and sink into the story because of how it was told but I did I did love the concept and once I understood the whole story I liked the what it was but I just wanted I wanted more does that make sense? So that was The Magician's Daughter. Eh. <laughs> so after that, I got on a 13 hour plane ride, which means I entered my romance novel era. I love reading romance on the airplane because these books are books that I can read in one sitting. They are laugh out loud funny. It's basically like watching a rom-com film, but it just takes twice as long. So it really helps pass the time. Um, highly recommend even if you aren't like I didn't think I was a romance girly and then I read what was it red white and royal blue on an airplane and I was just like this is my life now I read romance on airplanes so what I read was the bodyguard um, I heard about this from Cindy and she really enjoyed it and so I was like okay yes please really quickly um, the bodyguard is about a woman who is a bodyguard. She's basically like VIP security and she is tasked with guarding this Hollywood superstar as he comes home to help his mother through her cancer surgery and recovery. There's so much more to the story but like the main thing that you're probably curious about is he doesn't want his mother to know that he needs security and like he's at such a risk that he needs 24 hour in-person security um and he's like listen that would stress my mom out so i'm gonna need you to not say that you're my bodyguard and if you're gonna be with me at all times what else can you possibly be but my girlfriend and so yes it's a bodyguard and a fake dating trope and i thought it was done really well um it was just like super light-hearted cute. I enjoyed it. There's really nothing nothing more to say, but I had a really good time. Um so that's the bodyguard. Easy. Um oh, oh, oh. Also, zero smut. Zero smut. I will say it was just like yearning the whole time, which you know is my jam. So that's 100% a cute rom-com for people who don't like smut. But then, uh, just to like set the world at balance, my next book. <laughs> I read Hook, Line, and Sinker. <laughs> My last long flight, I read It Happened One Summer, and I was warned ahead of time of the smut. Thank God. I actually, okay, 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 hold on. In It Happened One Summer, I thought that the smut was actually really funny because we're in the girl's head the whole time, and her inner monologue is hilarious. So things were happening, but then you'd get a comment from her mind that was just hilarious. So I actually kind of enjoyed the smut in a sense in that way, but the dirty talk was horrific, cringe, The it was pathetic. I pitied this man. It was so bad. But overall, like I got through it and I liked the story. I thought, you know, as a romance where I went in prepared for the smut, it was good. Um, Hook, Line, and Sinker is the sequel. So in It Happened One Summer, we meet the main character's sister, and she kind of develops this weird, not really a crush, but there's a little chemistry between her and another character. And so Hook, Line, and Sinker follows the sister and this character. How it starts, page one we already have that chemistry going and so it is from page one smut city but 
the smut happens in their minds because they're both like so sexually attracted to each other and this is 100 i gotta say this book is about lust <laughs> i it she tried to frame it as like love and romance but to me it really felt like just a book about lust they are like so sexually attracted to each other that we just get lots of descriptions of like if i wasn't a respectful roommate because they end up being roommates for a, a couple weeks if i wasn't a respectful roommate i would be doing xyz and then we get this like daydream smut scene all right for the whole book i did not like this one as much as it happened one summer there was so much focus on the male character and his trauma that it just kind of like eclipsed everything else it basically talks about how young boys can also be sexualized and kind of peer pressured into being fuck boys essentially um and so the whole book is about his trauma of being a fuck boy being being expected to be a womanizer you know and our main girl kind of teaching him to undo that and not think that way so i mean it's more nuanced than that but i just didn't super dig the plot if there really was a plot it was just it was just smut smut city and i wasn't about it i wasn't about it but i finished it i did yeah i would say it happened one summer is by far the superior book and that's all that's all i gotta say i also felt a little bummed because I always wanted to be a music supervisor. That was like one of my dream jobs and that's what this, the main girl in this story also wants to be. But she never said music supervisor. She said something else like music coordinator or something. Anyway, so I was like, oh yay, my dream job represented in book form and then I got smut. <laughs> so, <sighs> but that was hook, line, and sinker. Ooh, next up, unexpected while I was gone. I got a package. Um, I would be holding the physical book, but I already gave it to a friend. Um, I read God Killer, not gonna lie, because of the cover. The cover is gorgeous. This is going to be a series. We follow four main characters. We get four different POVs. Um, and I remember reading it being like, oh my God, how many POVs are we gonna get? There's four. We first start the story um, back in the days when everybody worshipped gods and the gods are very real and very present beings and then when we switch to present day there has been a war and the king has made gods illegal they have killed all the gods and worshiping of any god is illegal right we follow one woman who is a god killer who goes around and if any god kind of makes itself known she goes off and kills it hence the name god killer she has a very personal vendetta against gods and people who worship gods we also have a young girl who has been inexplicably bound to a god and she's trying to solve that problem and then we have an ex soldier from the army that killed all of the gods and I don't know how to explain this plot but I thought it was interesting I thought it was slow I thought that the world was was really good but I thought that it was paced rather oddly. I think that I'm going to be very interested in the series. Um, I think as a first book it set things up well. Um, there were certain things that felt really shallow like there is a very tiny and I'm talking about teeny tiny bit of romance in it but that felt out of the blue. I think that the young girl and little god character are definitely the most interesting but I think that the story as it continues is going to get better. This was kind of laying some foundation work so if you are interested in stories about mythology and active gods I would check it out but it it definitely wasn't like the best but I will definitely read the second one just to see where it goes you know i really liked a lot of the characters so that was god killer after that i read always the almost um this was part of the trans rights readathon this was just a really cute contemporary young adult romance it was so wholesome we follow a character miles who has recently come out to his community um as trans and as a result um obviously his relationship with his parents has 
changed in different ways um, depending on his mom and dad. His boyfriend broke up with him because they started dating before he transitioned and his boyfriend is basically like, I'm not gay, I'm not interested in dating a boy, but also maybe he is, um, which is a problem that go is, goes on throughout the book. There is a super cute mysterious new boy at school who moved from the Pacific Northwest to Wisconsin um, and needs help understanding the weather. And as a background, um, Miles is also competing in this piano competition that's really important to him. And so we just kind of follow his life as he deals with about a million different crises at the same time. Um, and I just thought it was really wholesome and, and wonderful and realistic. I love when authors write young adult characters that act like young adults, but they're also so mature and so wise, which I feel like young people are, um, but sometimes authors will try and almost age them up and so they act, they don't seem like high school students on paper, and these characters felt like high school students. They are wise, but they are also flawed, um, and they're all just trying to figure things out. And yeah, I just love, love, loved it. And, and once again, it was another story about music. Um, and I loved the way that the piano was described and how music communicates things um, and yeah just overall like very quick to read but just really wonderful if you're looking for um, a new young adult romance that has pianos and Christmas sweaters and pizza and just really great relationships whether it's friendships, family, mentors, teachers, and romance all together. It was just really good, really excellent. Oh my gosh, after that <laughs> I read a book called I Have Some Questions For You. This is by the same author who wrote, oh, I'll put it here, um, but a few people I know have said that this is like one of their favorite books of all time. So when I saw that she had a new book out, I immediately went and picked it up. And it was not at all what I expected and not good. What I have some questions for you is, is basically a, a thriller. So the book follows a woman who is now older married, has kids, but as she was growing up she went to this high school that was a boarding school and while she was there, her senior year, there was a murder and she ends up coming back to school to teach um, a class on film and podcasting because she has a podcast. Uh, like everyone. She gets kind of re-wrapped up in this case because she's always been low-key obsessed with the case. One of her students decides that the podcast she's gonna make for class is gonna be about this. So they start going over the clues and everything and they truly believe that the wrong man was convicted. So in the beginning, I was, I was into it. I was like, oh my God, I was already thinking of telling you guys that this would be a really good alternative to The Maidens, which is a thriller I did not enjoy. It was, it was so close. It had it all going for it and then it just fell apart. The narrator is so obnoxious and so self-centered and like I don't think the author meant for her to be that way. Like sometimes authors write characters that are insufferable. I don't think this character was supposed to be as insufferable as she was. The author tried to bring in so many different things and didn't actually talk about any of them. So it's mentioned um, in the beginning that, you know, the student who is doing the podcast also mentions how she thinks that true crime and especially like white women's obsession with true crime is really toxic and there's a lot of negative things about it, which I wanted to hear more about because I also feel that way. I try not to be involved with true crime anymore, um, so I was interested in hearing her take on that. Didn't actually really talk about that. Um, it talked about how the man who was wrongly convicted, it was obviously a racial and classist bias that put him in jail. He's been in jail for like 20 years. It's mentioned occasionally how unjust and horrible that is, but not really. Like she makes a lot of snide remarks about how we remember the girl who's killed because she was like young and white and pretty, but like the whole book is focused on her, the young, white and pretty girl. Like 
instead of any of the other characters like the young black man that they locked up like it was just i felt like she thought she was saying so much when she actually said nothing. I just ended up being really upset at the end of this book because I, I couldn't tell what she was trying to say. It just made me really mad and I really don't recommend it. And I don't, I read, um, I went and immediately read the reviews on Goodreads to, to see if I was the only one that felt that way. And thank God Goodreads people were like, what the fuck? Because I, Thought I was going crazy. I thought I read it wrong. Like it was, I'm so mad about this book. Um, so this is, I have some questions for you. High key, do not recommend. After that, I feel like I'm being so negative this month. I'm so sorry. I'm actually going to devote an entire video to the next book that I read because it is so bonkers that I need to tell you about it. Um, it is A Wilderness of Stars by Shay Earnshaw. This book came out in November of 2022. I really like Shay Earnshaw, so I requested that my library buy it, and then that automatically put me in line for it once they actually bought it, and it took them until March 2023 to purchase it, and that was, and that surprised me because I thought that her first two books did really well, so I was surprised that my library didn't kind of immediately purchase it but now maybe I know why. I loved The Wicked Deep by Shay Earnshaw. I liked Winterwood by Shay Earnshaw and then I didn't really love A History of Wild Places but I like got what she was trying to do and I was like okay like that was a little bit of a miss but I'm sure once we go back to YA you'll be fine girly. <laughs> Like I said, I'm going to commit a whole video to this, but this was the most bizarre book. <laughs> in theory, it had everything I was interested in. It was this kind of dystopian, post-apocalyptic, you don't really know what's going on kind of book. It involves astronomy. It involves a girl who has been kind of hidden from society all of her life and having to finally leave the safety of home and go on an adventure to save the world. Um, and then it just kind of gets flipped on its head. I felt like there were huge swaths of the story missing. So many things felt instantaneous and so short and it just didn't make I didn't connect with a single character. I'm gonna go into more detail, but it was just truly a bizarre book. I would not label it fantasy. I would label it sci-fi, but I believe it is talked about as if it's a fantasy book. And I read the acknowledgments and I just, I feel like authors should learn not to say this in public, but in her acknowledgments, she thanks her husband for helping her like listen to her ideas as she wrote the first draft or the she wrote the outline um and first draft of this book in a month the fastest quote quote the fastest she's ever written a book um or i believe you know i believe she's just talking about kind of the outline of it but I just felt like this book needed to be cooked a little bit more. Also, she started writing it in 2019 and it's about a pandemic and it's just, ooh, I just, it was, it was truly, truly bizarre. Truly bizarre. I will talk about it in detail soon. A Wilderness of Stars. And this comes from a fan, a true fan of her work. <sighs> After that, the last book I read, trying to be kind of quick, is Wayward, which came out really recently um, and it is an adult fantasy about a family of witches. It is told in three different points of view, three different timelines we follow, um, three different members of the family. I thought it was really good but it definitely you need to look up trigger warnings ahead of time. There is so much domestic violence, there is sexual assault, there is rape, there um, is a lot of talk about abortion and pregnancy and trauma related to that. Um, so really like go into it armed with 
whatever knowledge you need. I thought that it was really good. I thought that it was dark and I wanted a little bit more witchcraft actually in the book. Um, this was really more of a story just about women. They, it, it really wasn't about witches. My battery's gonna die. I'm on the last book. Come on. So yeah, I really, I really thought that this was more just a story about women and women having so much power, but that power always being taken away by the different powers that men have. There were a lot of parts that were difficult to read. One of the witches is being tried for witchcraft. Um, so we kind of follow her trial. Our middle girl is a young girl in the 40s? Anyway, in there, I think it's the 40s. Yeah, it is. Who is having trouble being the young lady that her kind of tyrannical, war-loving father um, wants her to be. She loves insects. And so she wants to study them and travel the world and she just loves being in nature and climbing trees and ladies don't do that. Um, so we follow her through that. And then our present day woman is someone who is trapped in horrible domestic violence situation, um, but she escapes. And the only place she can go is the cottage that she inherited from her family. Um, that she has kept secret and it is the cottage of the girl from the 1940s. You see how it's all connected? And so we learn about the family, this line of women. We learn somewhat about their powers, but not really. Like I said, they're kind of very watered down witches. They're essentially just women who know a lot about plants. <laughs> but I did like it. I did like how it all tied together um, and yeah, like I said, it's just a story about women and their power and reclaiming it and uh, yeah, overall good. But I would say if you're going into it for the fantasy element, it's not there at all, I would say. But wayward. And then I know I said that was the last book, but I just want to give a shout out because I'm reading it right now. Um, if you're looking for nonfiction, I'm currently reading Flowers of Fire. Uh, which was recommended to me by a friend, and so thank you, Gisela. This was written really recently by a journalist here in Korea um, who has covered the feminist movement for a very long time, and so this book is kind of just detailing the major players and a lot of big court cases and, and kind of the movers and shakers of the women's rights movement here. Um, since kind of just this last decade. It is so interesting because the feminist movement here, especially in Korea, is really complicated. So far, I'm only a third of the way through the book, but it's been really good. It sort of reads just like an article, but there are these moments um, that read a little bit more like a novelization of it. Um, so I would definitely recommend it if that's what you're looking for. Um, it has things, I thought that I was pretty up to date on the news and, and things that have happened recently, but there are quite a few details that I missed. And there's just a lot of interviews, like there was just so much research put into this. So um, I also want to give that a moment. Flowers of Fire, um, check it out. So, oh my God. Now that my voice is really, really gone, <laughs> I'm going to end the video here. What do we have in our future? Let me look. Yeah, so next up will hopefully be my Shadow and Bone. I almost said Shadow of Crows. <laughs> Um, shadow and bone reaction and then I promise to tell you about wilderness of stars because so yeah I will see you guys next time thank you as always for being here thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring this uh, information will be down below but you can go to squarespace.com slash Carrie can read for 10% off of your first website or domain um, and yeah I I literally wish I could say more but my throat hurts and I have talked for way too long. I thought I was going to be quick about all these books, but <laughs> so um, yeah, just thank you always. And if you want some spring content, um, I am going to head out any moment um, to go chase some cherry blossoms around Seoul as well before the sun goes down. So I will see you guys later. Uh, I will link my other channel down below because yes, I do have another channel. Every video people are like, what? And yeah, I will catch you guys next time with Shadow and Bone. All right? Okay. Bye. <laughs>